I'm not going to regale you with all this, but you know some of the some of the reasons. Right right now, the president and his party say they want to get the economy going again. Look what they're doing and ask: Does that encourage the private sector to add jobs, or does it discourage investment and pioneering and innovation? When they say they're going to raise capital gains taxes, does that encourage investment? Obviously not. When they say they're going to raise taxes at the highest level, does that help sub S corporations invest more, or does it cause them to pull back? Obviously. When they say they're going to put in place a cap and trade bill, which they tell you will substantially raise the cost of energy, they just don't know by how much. Does that encourage a business that's energy intensive to make a big investment? Of course not. How about cap and trade? Excuse me. How about card check? How about this idea that we're going to take away from the American worker the right to choose by secret ballot whether they want a union or not, because they've been losing too many elections? These liberals want to force unions into every company, whether the Union member, whether, excuse me, whether the employees want them or not. And think what that says to an entrepreneur. Do I really want to invest all my savings, my parents' savings, my friends' savings in an enterprise not knowing if it's going to be unionized and therefore my, what my cost is going to be? You go down the list of things they've done. They have so frightened and terrified the private sector. They have lengthened and deepened this term now. Perhaps nothing more uh, outrageous than the, the health care bill where Government says we are now going to take over roughly one fifth of the U.S. economy. We're now going to run healthcare at the federal level instead of letting the free market create new ideas and new products and new services. They instead are going to manage healthcare for us with a bill, 2,700 pages. Think of all the rules that are going to be written, all the legislation which will follow on this. It's a, an outrageous grab of power from the states and from the American people. And then, of course, there's the the spending. A lot of us were upset during the Bush years with the excessive spending by Republicans. Over $400 billion deficit in the highest year. This year, however, the deficit is $1.8 trillion. And the forecast over the next 10 years, given the President's plan, is to add $10 trillion to the deficit, more than doubling the national debt in just 10 years. Anyone here know how much a trillion is? I mean, it's... it's <laughs> Twelve zeros. Twelve zeros. <laughs> I mean, someone said to me, if, if um, I think these numbers are right, a billion seconds is 32 years. A trillion seconds is 32,000 years. If you earned a million dollars, you know how many years it would take you to get a trillion? A million years. It's a vast amount of money. The total economy of America, everything we buy and sell, every haircut, every shoe shine, every piece of food, everything we buy in a year, is about $14 trillion. And the debt's going to go from $8 trillion to $18 trillion over the next decade. And just as bad, the promises my generation, the baby boomers, that this generation has made to me and to my colleagues in the baby boom generation, is so massive, it's underfunded by almost $100 trillion. The generation that will follow my generation will not know the American dream unless we change course. I, uh, I would, a chapter in this book you might enjoy reading called The Worst Generation. I put a question mark after it because I think there's time to change. But unless we recognize the truth and make adjustments to our entitlements to make sure they are sustainable, we will kill the American dream for our kids. Washington is smothering the American dream, and we must not let Washington do it. Now, there's some other mistakes that are being taken in Washington that I think uh, are just as, uh, is just as frightening. I. Uh, I have to look at the foreign policy with, uh, with some dismay. I'm sure you do. You just saw what happened this week with the president um, signing uh, uh, actions or taking actions that related to nuclear policy, which I think weaken America and weaken our capacity to protect ourselves. But there are other things. How about when the Honduras Supreme Court announces that their president, a pro-Chavez, anti-American president, mm -hmm. has violated their constitution, and they and the military call for his rejection, and he's taken out of office, and then our president, insists on putting him back in. How does that happen? How is it that when there are voice, voices of dissent that go to the street in Iran, that our president has nothing to say? Can you imagine Ronald Reagan having nothing to say if voices of dissent went to the streets in Iran? How is it that some of our best allies in the entire world, the Czech Republic and Poland, have gone to work with their population to get them to agree to allow them to be the, the, the site of a missile defense system to protect Western Europe from attacks from a nation like, a rogue nation like Iran. They go on battle to do that. And then this president, without any warning to them, abruptly withdraws from that missile defense proposition. Apparently to reset relations for, with Russia, for which we got nothing. 
not even tough sanctions against Iran. And by the way, the day he did this, the day he announced this, was the day that was being, um, I won't say commemorated, but a day that was being considered in Poland as the 70th anniversary of the Russian invasion of Poland. That's why the people in Poland were so shocked. How can the president take action like that with our allies being so abused? Think about the president speaking before the United Nations. He got up and spoke there and attacked Israel, our best ally in the Middle East, for the construction of settlements, but had nothing to say about the Palestinians launching 7,000 rockets into Israel and killing Israeli civilians. This is, uh, in my opinion, a dramatic departure from our historic foreign policy, one which said that ever since Truman and Atchison, Dean Atchison, they said, look, there are three keys to our foreign policy. One, we'll, we'll be involved in the affairs of the world. Number two, we will promote democracy, human rights, freedom, American values, if you will. And number, number three, we'll be strong. We will be strong by standing with our allies. And this president has violated those things. And then the title of my book, No Apology, refers in part to the fact that the president wanted a, an apology tour around the world. He went to Europe and said, we've been arrogant, dismissive, derisive that we haven't listened to the concerns of others. He went on Arabic TV and said that we have dictated other nations. No, Mr. President. No, Mr. President. We have freed other nations from this. <laughs> I saw today a quote which, uh, uh, which is troubling and humorous at the same time. It's from a professor at Pepperdine University. Uh, Professor um, Kaufman, I believe, he said the great thing, roughly, the great thing about Ronald Reagan is that he recognized that he was an ordinary man representing an extraordinary nation. But unfortunately, our new president, he says, thinks he's an extraordinary man representing an ordinary nation. Uh, this, this is no ordinary nation. This is an exceptional nation of such greatness and magnitude. It has sacrificed more than any nation in the history of the earth for liberty for ourselves and for our friends, and there's nothing for which America needs to apologize to the world. With all that said, let me tell you that I'm overwhelmingly optimistic about what's about to happen. You're seeing movements across this country which, which, which say that just like in the past, Americans are rising to the occasion. We're recognizing what's happening and we're taking action. There is a grassroots swell across this nation of all sorts of conservatives and, uh, and, and, uh, and folks in the middle of the road and independents and Republicans that are saying, wait a second, we've got to get America on track. We've got to deal honestly with the challenges that we have. And we've got to recognize that the, the foundations, as, as Governor Pelletti just said, the foundations of our economy, of our strength, of our liberty are under attack. I, uh, I'm happy when I see that kind of support as I go around the country and as I see people elect people like Scott Brown and Bob McDonald and, and Chris Christie, but, uh, but I've seen it throughout my life. The, the governor had been indicated that I had the opportunity to, to run the Olympics in, uh, in 2002 in Salt Lake City, and, and I got to see the spirit of some of our young people up close. It's that confidence in that spirit that gives me the confidence I have that our future is bright and that the challenges we face we will rise to and we will overcome. This happens to be a story, one of my favorites from our games. Um, the Vice President, Dick Cheney, came to our closing ceremonies. And he said, Mitt, would you pick one athlete to come sit with me in the President's box? And I said, sure, and I picked Derek Parra. Derek is uh, about as tall as Bonnie Blair. He's about 5'4". And uh, he's Hispanic American, born in, uh, in Los Angeles. He's got great big thighs. As you might imagine, if he's going to be a speed skater. And he is. He, he was a rollerblader, though. And he wanted to get a gold medal in, in something in the Olympics. And it was pointed out there's no Olympic event of rollerblading. So he strapped on ice skates. He had not ice skated before. I skated before. And believe it or not, this little guy from Los Angeles you know, took on the big guys from here in Wisconsin and Michigan and so forth and beat him. And became a member of the United States speed skating team came out to Salt Lake City, skated his heart out, won a silver medal in the 1,000 meters, and then a gold medal in the 500 meters. Fastest man on earth on skates. Can you imagine being the best in the world at anything? Be like being Kevin McHale. You know, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's an absolute <laughs> So I invited, I invited this Derek Parr to come in and sit with the vice president at the closing ceremonies. And uh, as he was coming into the box, I said, Derek, 
what was the most memorable experience in your Olympic Games? And he said, uh, won the silver medal. 